Welcome to Family History Mysteries, a podcast that tells the stories uncovered through family history research, the unexpected stories of everyday people. I am an avid family historian who has been compiling my family tree for over 15 years, with nearly 20,000 people recorded in my trees. Episode 79, Part 2, The Bertha Shippen Mystery. Just a warning, there is some graphic information in this episode. If you haven't already, please ensure that you listen to the part one section of this episode before listening to this part. What is going to be uncovered in this episode is Mary Shippen's statements in the inquest, as well as her mother's and her father's. And then it will also cover the court case, theories behind the murder, and what became of the Shippen family for the rest of their lives after this sensational inquest and court case. So I commence with the continuation of the inquest. Mary Augustus Shippen, 24 years of age, was the next witness called. She was calm and composed as she appeared. The crowd pressed in around the court. Her evidence was as follows. On New Year's Day, Bertha and myself were in the house all day until dinner time, the boys having gone out to shoot parrots after breakfast. My brother Willie cleaned the parrots in the stable. Nobody helped him. In the morning, Bertha was dressed in a black skirt and blouse. Willie needed a black-handled knife to clean the parrots. It was the larger of the two knives produced and was found in the safe. After cleaning the birds, Willie washed the knife. I don't know where he dried it, but he said he put it on the kitchen table. I don't remember seeing it afterwards. I don't know where he washed it. Willie also washed the parrots in a tin dish. Don't know for sure which dish. He then fetched the parrots inside, gave them to me and I put them in the safe. The boys afterwards got dressed and went to Jim Blancaren's place where they remained until they returned for dinner. They went there again in the afternoon. Bertha had dinner with us. We had cold salt meat. There was no fresh meat in the house. The last fresh meat we had was before father and mother went away. Bertha and myself stayed home until about five o'clock when Bertha went to Henke's girls. When Bertha went with Henke's girls to Mrs. Matchison's place, Bertha changed her clothes in the afternoon to a red striped blouse and white skirt. I saw the girls in the paddock at half past six. I called to Bertha to help me to water the sheep. She came home and then we watered the sheep, after which we had tea together about seven o'clock. I cleared the table and we washed up. I sat outside until nearly eight o'clock. I then lit the lamp to go to bed and when we had just got into the bedroom with the lamp, my two brothers came into the kitchen. Bertha was also in the bedroom. We were not undressed when the boys were in the kitchen. I took out the lamp to them, putting it on the table. The boys asked for some cake and I gave them some out of the safe. I sat on the sofa and waited until they had tea. I left everything on the table and then the boys and Bertha and myself went to bed. The boys shut the kitchen door but did not fasten it. To open it from the outside, a string must be pulled to raise the latch. It can be fastened inside with a peg, but it is never done before going to bed. I had on a black skirt, a pink blouse and a white apron. I took these things off and put them in the pantry. To do that, I had to go outside. I came back to shut the kitchen door and went to my room. Bertha was just going to bed. I took off my shoes and blew the light out and went to bed alongside Bertha. Bertha slept on the inside next to the wall and I sleep on the outside. We went to bed about 8.30. We were awake about a quarter of an hour in bed. The door leading from our parents' room outside to the north was closed and fastened with a peg. After going to bed, Bertha and I talked for a quarter of an hour. We did not speak again. I went to sleep. I think Bertha was asleep then. We never heard anything until after, I think, 10 o'clock. I woke and felt something heavy across me. The next part says the man and his knife. I turned round and a person jumped up. I got out of bed. He caught me by my two arms and pushed me up against the sewing machine. I got near to the kitchen door. I was knocked against the little table. I got near to the middle door and I felt he had something in his hand. I felt it was a knife. While I was just near the middle door, I heard something drop. That was the knife. I got loose I had an old skirt lying on the chair in my bedroom near the middle of the door leading to the kitchen. I caught hold of this and rushed out from the middle room through the kitchen and out through the kitchen door into the open air. The coroner asked, there is no light? And she said, no, there was no light. 
How did you find your way to the door? She said, I knew my way. How was the door fastened? She said, the kitchen door was closed with the latch on. I opened the door, caught hold of the string and pulled the latch up. From the time you woke up and when the struggling began, did you call out? Yes, I called out, Gus Dave, Gus Dave. Did you call out loud? And she said, yes. Did your sister hear you? Yes, she called out, Gus Dave, Gus Dave. She was in bed? And the witness said, yes, I think so. That was when I was struggling with the man. I heard her call out. Did your sister make any effort to get out of bed while you were struggling with the man? She said, I don't know that. There was nothing to prevent her. Mr Sinclair asked, prior to dropping it, you did not know he had a knife? No, not before. How long was the man in the room before you heard the knife drop? About 10 minutes, she said. He was pushing me about besides knocking me against the sewing machine. He pushed me against the wall. I don't remember going over the same room twice. He pushed me along the western side once as far as I could remember. Bertha was nearly as tall as I am. Was she sickly or strong? She was not so very strong because she had been ill about six months ago with bad fits. Since then, she had been in pretty good health. When you found the man lying across you, did you speak or call anyone? No, I did not speak or call out. Did you try to wake Bertha? I just screamed out when I found him lying over me. Before you went out at any time, did you hear her speak or get out of bed? No, I can't remember. Did you know if she was out of bed before you left the room? I don't know. When the man caught hold of your wrist, did you continue screaming? Yes, I screamed as loud as I could. Did you at any time call for Bertha's assistance? Yes, when the man had hold of me. What was the man doing or saying when he was pushing you? He never spoke and only said shut up when I was screaming. Were you screaming out nearly the whole time when you were in the house? Yes, I screamed pretty often. Could you tell by the nearness of contact the height of the man? I judged he was about the same height as myself. You did not trip or fall? No. I bumped against the western wall on going around as much as I remember. I only bumped against the wall once. How did you know the man had a knife in the right hand when the room was so dark? I grabbed a hold of it and touched the part of the blade and handle. In what part of the room were you in then? Just near the middle door. After he picked it up from the floor? No, before he dropped it. Do you know anyone who has had ill feeling against yourself or Bertha? I don't understand. Anyone not good friends? No. Did the man try to do anything to you? Not that I remember. Did he leave go of you altogether when the knife dropped? No, he had a hold of my left arm. When the knife dropped, he let go my right arm and I got loose. Sometimes my father has a bit of a temper. No strangers called at our house during my father's absence, up to the time the murder occurred. I recognised the hair produced in the paper wrappings. I always wrap up my combings after I comb my hair until I get a number. The hair produced is my combings. The witness here minutely described the style of dressing her hair on the night of the murder. Mine and Bertha's hair was down. The man caught hold of my hair only once. He grasped it at the back, about the middle of the room. He did not attempt any indecency. I don't know whether I shut the kitchen door or left it open when I left to call the boys. I identify Bertha's blouse. I had a blouse of the same kind, of the same material and pattern. I made them myself. Mine was kept in the bedroom. Did you do anything with your blouse? She said no. It has not turned up yet? No. Or destroyed in any way? Did anyone get rid of it? Not that I know of. Have you been wearing it lately? No, I always wore my pink blouse. When did you wear the blue one last? I don't remember the particular times I have worn it lately. Look at these pieces of bloodstained blouse. And she said, they are a part of my blouse. We're both made of the same material? Yes. Did you only have two blouses of this same material in the house? And she said, yes. Two pieces of bloodstained linen produced have hand-sewn seams and a third piece of the same material has no seams. Look at these pieces. Is it all one item? She said it looks so. When Dr Steele and others were in the room, was anything given to you by Mr Mullahan? She said yes, two towels. What sort? Two clean white towels? I got them out of a box. Did Mr Mulligan say what he wanted them for? She said no. What became of them? My father said they were going in the coffin. 
did your father say anything more about it? She said, no. Did you have curling pins in your hair? She said, yes. Do you know whose hair this is? And she said, I think it is too dark for mine. She was asked, was Bertha's hair darker than yours? Yes, the hair now produced is, I think, some of mine. I cannot say that a few stray hairs produced are mine or my sister's. Mary explained on the night of the tragedy, she had not put her hair in pins. She had made that mistake in her evidence. Mary gave her evidence firmly and very bravely, displaying not the least outward signs of emotion. She answered every query with perfect readiness and without apparent reserve. And a statement by Mary's sweetheart. After Mary Shippen had given her evidence, Gustav Nitschke, labourer of Tawita, was called. He said, I have been keeping company with Mary Shippen for about 12 months. I remember being on Shippen's farm on the Sunday before New Year's Day. I arrived in the afternoon. Only Mary was home in the afternoon. Familiarity happened at 10pm at night in the kitchen. Bertha was in the next room. There was no light in the house at all that night. Bertha was in the kitchen for a short period. When she returned from Blenkiron's, she was there for about an hour. I was speaking and joking with her. Mary and I were on the sofa. Bertha was on the other side of the room and I said, I am going to town and asked deceased if she would like to come with me. Bertha replied, you had better ask Mary. Bertha went to bed and Mary and I remained in the kitchen. It was after Bertha was in bed that something occurred. The door communicating from the kitchen to the bedroom was closed. I cannot say whether Bertha knew of what took place within. Neither of the girls spoke to me as to when they expected their parents home. Improprieties took place on other nights before this, on Sunday, in the barn and altogether about half a dozen times. I don't know whether Bertha knew this. I was in Adelaide on New Year's Day staying in Carrington Street. I know nobody who has fallen out with the Shippen girls. I never knew of Mary having any other sweetheart other than myself. I don't know whether Bertha had a sweetheart. Mrs Shippen's evidence. Mrs Johanna Elizabeth Shippen, mother of the deceased, said... With my husband, I left home on Friday the 27th of December and went to Eden Valley. I told the girls and boys that we would be home on January the 2nd. We came home on Thursday, January the 2nd, about one in the afternoon, on account of something that we had been told. I found Mary and the boys at the farm but did not see Bertha's body. I spoke to Mary and asked her where Bertha was, and she said she is dead and gave particulars of the tragedy. She said that a man had pulled her out of bed. Mary has been home ever since we returned and has been doing her work about the house. I know of no one who has been bad friends with the girls or our family. Did any of the girls have blouses of the material and kind of the cuff sleeve produced? She said, yes, they are of Mary's blouse. Was it the blouse Mary has been wearing? She wore it, but not lately. She did not wear it for two weeks before January the 1st. Please look at the bloodstained blouse and the chemise. And the mother said they were Bertha's. I don't know whose other stockings produced. Her mother broke down badly after giving her own testimony and had to be escorted back to the house by Reverend D. McNaughton and Constable Beckman. The father recalled. Matthias Shippen, father of the victim, recalled. He said on the day of the funeral that he saw the two towels which had been given to Dr. Steele and they were used to cover the body and were buried with it. Evidence was given today concerning the burial of two towels with the body, which might have been preserved, possibly giving another reason for the exhumation of the body of Bertha. This, however, was not considered necessary for the inquest, and the matter was discussed and referred. Formal evidence, Dr Ramsey Smith's statement, bloodstained garments. Dr Ramsey Smith said that on the 6th of January he received from MC Mowbray of Adelaide one box containing of two pieces of cloth, a pink blouse, a pair of black stockings, a towel and two knives. I examined the pieces of cloth in the box and found some slight stains on both pieces. One was very lightly stained. I examined the pieces from which I cut from both and found blood on them. These were the pieces that Dr Steele had wiped Mary with. On the left shoulder of the pink blouse there were a few spots and on the top of the right shoulder were minute spots, while on the right of the left there were two small spots. I cut out a piece with a spot on it and found that it was a blood spot. From an ordinary examination with a glass, I'm of the opinion that there were other blood spots. That was the blouse which Mary had on in bed. On one of the stockings, from three to four inches below the front knee, there is a stiff stain 
about one and a half inches long by an inch wide. This was peculiar. I found it was a blood stain. If the stocking were pulled fully up, nearly all of the blood would be on the inside and it had the character of a splash that had been a little, if at all, rubbed. There were numerous spots in the lower part of this stocking, especially over the top of the instep and the foot. These spots were composed of blood mixed with sand and brown earth, but here and there were other spots of purest blood. On the other stocking in a position corresponding to the position on the other stocking, there was a stain. This was formed of blood that had been rubbed into the fibre. It had been pressed into the fibre. Brown colour, similar to those on the other one. These stockings were worn by Mary when she went to Lambert's. I examined the towel and I found that the marks were blood stains and the blood was well in the substance of the fibres. On this towel I found a number of hairs. Some of them were fixed on the towel by clotted blood. I removed them and now I produced them separately. This was the towel Dr. Steele could not identify as the one he used when examining Mary. The hairs are fine and light, almost white. One or two are darker in colour than the others. They look as if they belong to the same individual and nearly all have roots. In regards to the knives which I examined, the smaller one has one or two small spots on the blades, but nothing distinctive of blood marks. The larger knife had a notch about halfway along the back of it, like it had been struck by a hammer, which raised the steel, in that there were some fibres of wool of a sheep and blood and skin. There were two spots of animal matter, blood and shreds of skin and other material on the blade, probably from a sheep. There were also a number of small glistening streaks on the handle of the knife, and blood had gotten into the grain of the wood. These were composed of shreds of muscle, blood and skin, and filled up the small depressions in the wood. I have examined the exhibits of hair found on the bed and in the kitchen. The hairs are fine and light in colour and blood was found on both the roots and the hair generally. There were a few hairs darker than the others, but they were not black hairs. I also examined the hair identified as Mary's. It's composed of fine light hairs covered with a good deal of dust and other debris. Some of these were much darker than others. I have examined the skirt shown by me. There were blackish and brown spots on the front of it, but I cannot give an unqualified opinion as to what they were. This was the skirt Mary put on as she left the house. I've examined numerous spots on the walls of the house, which were pointed out to be by Detective Priest. All of these spots have a general character of blood stains, and I have chemically and crossopically examined several of them and find that they were made by blood. These stains were splashes, spurts and smears. There was a little blood on the knife. In the dry condition of the blood on the larger knife, I could not say without a much more careful examination whether the blood was sheep's blood or human. I may say that the most careful examination might not allow one to speak definitely because there is so little difference. With the blood so dried, it is impossible to say, but I should say that the blood in the notch of the knife from the way it was mixed with wool was sheep's blood. I could tell by a more careful examination whether the stains on the skirt were blood. By microscopic examination, they were blood. I am very wary of saying that they definitely were human blood stains, although everything points to them being so. The hair combings show hair roots in dry or shriveled condition without any blood. In the exhibit of hair found on the bed in the kitchen and the roots are generally swollen and juicy and have blood on them and on the bulbs of the roots. And he also stated that it indicated with the blood on the roots that they were not caused from naturally falling out. The coroner, Mr William Mulligan, who was deeply affected, briefly summed up in the following words. You have heard the evidence the same as I have. There is one thing I wish to point out, and that is the evidence of Dr Ramsay Smith. I also wish to draw attention to the blood stains on Mary Shippen's dress. It is your duty to ascertain, if possible, if those stains came on her, you are aware no blood was shed in the house when she left it, according to her statement, so you will have to find out how she got blood on her dress. No pains have been spared by the officers to investigate the matter, and we have had the best men in the state. And the verdict, the jury retired at 5.55pm, and after an hour's consultation returned with their verdict. When the court reassembled, Mary, looking deathly pale, was brought into the court, her father standing beside her. Complete silence prevailed as the coroner rose to read the verdict, but he apparently found great difficulty in deciphering the penmanship and announced it with a painful suspense between nearly every word, one of which he dwelt on for nearly a minute. The verdict was as follows. We, the jury, are of the opinion that Bertha Elizabeth Shippen met her death on the first night of January 1902 
by having her throat cut by Mary Augusta Shippen. The effect of the verdict, it was received by a large number of spectators in complete silence and Mary, who retained absolute composure, displayed great fortitude. The girl sat like a marble statue while the verdict was read. She flinched once, but her countenance set itself again, and then she appeared as calm and collected as when she gave her evidence. Mrs Shippen was inside the house, quite prostrated. The father was dazed, and the verdict was a surprise to him. He was most tender towards his daughter, although the blow to him was severe. The coroner called up Mary Shippen and said that she stood charged before one of His Majesty's Justices of the Peace on January the 10th for what she did on the first day of January 1902, willfully and with malice, a forethought killed and murdered Bertha Elizabeth Shippen. The charge having been read to her, he addressed her in the following terms. Having heard the evidence, do you wish to say anything to the charge? You are not obliged to say anything unless you desire to do so, but what you say will be written down and marked against you in trial. On advice by Mr Foster, Mary said nothing, and she was then committed for trial in the next criminal sittings held at Adelaide. Mary was taken away sobbing and placed in a cell in Angerston and then was transferred to Adelaide the following day. It was reported that there was a most painful scene between the parents and the daughter at the parting before she went to Angerston. The mother clasped her daughter in her arms and both cried bitterly and Mary said, I did not do it, mother. And both parents replied, we know you did not, girl. Mrs Shippen, for whom much sympathy is felt, exclaimed, I have lost two daughters at once. The inquest focused strongly on several small bloodstains which were on a skirt that Mary said she had grabbed as she ran out of the house to escape her attacker. The family insisted that these came from a sheep which had been slaughtered days earlier. Another mystery surrounded the clothes Mary had worn that night. She left the house to seek help in a pink blouse. She testified that she also owned a blue blouse. The significance of this was that a blood-stained blue cuff and sleeve fragment had been found under Bertha's body. The rest of Mary's blue blouse was never found. There were also questions about Mary's hair. The doctor who examined her said it had been freshly washed, but Constable Lambert's mother stated that Mary had not washed her hair at the Lambert's house. So where and when had this happened, and why? The case was considered so sensational that a team of horse and bicycle couriers was set up to relay the news from Twitter back to Adelaide. Rival papers, the advertiser and the register, tried desperately to be the first to publish the breaking news, but the advertiser had a secret weapon. They had bought a motor car. This was the first time a car had been used for reporting the news and it made Australian journalism history as it raced to the telegraph station at Angerston, 26 kilometres from Twitter. Mary's trial began in March 1902 in Adelaide and lasted six days. She was represented by a leading South Australian barrister, Sir Josiah Simon. His fee of 50 guineas was paid by a local farmer who knew the Shippen family. Simon relentlessly pursued the idea that Mary's fiancé, Gustav Nitschke, was the real culprit. Despite having a watertight alibi for the night of the murder, Simon managed to persuade the court that Gustav was the guilty party. He had treated Mary shabbily and caused a rift between the two sisters. Gustav admitted in court to sexual intimacy with Mary and openly flirting with young Bertha. At the same time, Gustav was pursuing another local girl, whose wealthy background made her a better marriage prospect. And this local girl with a wealthy background was actually Clara Schwanfeld, who at the time of the murder was actually engaged to Gustav Nitschke. And on the 10th of March 1902, Nitschke's alibi. Rudolf Schwanfeld, storekeeper living in Carrington Street, Adelaide, said, My manager at Sedan employed Gustav Nitschke to drive a wagon between Sedan and Adelaide. On Tuesday, December the 31st, Nitschke appeared with the team at my yard in Carrington Street between 5 and 6 p.m. He was at my place on New Year's Day and I saw him in the evening long after dark. I also saw him on the 2nd of January and on the following morning he left for Sedan. He is not now in my employ. I hear that he left my manager of his own accord. Mary Jane Cook, housekeeper, to the previous witness, corroborated with Mr Schwansfeld's evidence as to Nitschke's movements at the time of the tragedy. The threats and physical attacks that Gustav received because of these admissions led to him fleeing South Australia and changing his name. 
On the 12th of March 1902, there's an article outlining how Nischke was assaulted. It says Gustav Nischke, who has gained an unenviable notoriety by the way in which he gave away his sweetheart, Mary Shippen, in his evidence at the inquest on Bertha Shippen and at the trial of Mary, got badly mauled by the populace in Adelaide on Monday evening. He unwisely sallied out of the court without the escort of police that was allowed him, walked down King William Street, followed by a crowd of jeering men and women who increased in number every yard of the way. At the Franklin Street corner, two or three men closed in on him, struck him on the mouth and eye and knocked his hat off. He defended himself as best he could and rushed over to the cab stand and asked several cabmen to take him up and away, but the crowd prevented him. He went to the Prince Alfred Hotel and was hustled out and received more blows. Then he sat at bay on the pavement at the entrance to the town hall and shouted murder and police. A lot of the women seemed desirous for the exercise of lynch law. At length, a policeman pushed his way through the crowd and rescued the unhappy man and drove him away in a cab amid the groans of hundreds. The whole scene was very unlike Australia and un-British. On the 14th of March 1902, the Shippen case. The trial of Mary Augusta Shippen for the murder of her sister Bertha at Tewitta on the 1st of January has been concluded after a very careful bearing extending over five days. The suggestion of the prosecution was that the murder was either prompted by jealousy arising from an invitation from the more despicable than Cad Nishki to Bertha to accompany him to Adelaide or by fear that the knowledge of Mary's alleged misconduct with Nitschke, passed by Bertha, would be communicated to the father upon his return home. The Crown relied upon certain circumstantial evidence, the presence of blood spots on the clothing of the accused, and for the motive of the evidence tendered by Nitschke, respecting an alleged conversation with Bertha, and his misconduct with the accused, which he gave with heartless candour. On the evidence of Dr Steele, who considered that the fatal stab had been given by a right-handed person from behind, and that of Dr Ramsey to prove the bloodstains and the nature of them. After considering the circumstantial evidence very carefully, the Crown concluded with, I commit the life of Mary Ship into your hands, believing that you will turn an eye of pity upon her unhappy condition, and that you will solve every doubt in her favour, and that by pronouncing her not guilty of this atrocious and abominable crime, you will do right by her and carry home with you, when you leave the precincts of this court, the unspeakable satisfaction of a proving conscience. May the great father of us all direct you all right. On Tuesday, the Chief Justice summed up the case to the jury, who retired shortly after six o'clock to consider their verdict, and after two hours' deliberation, they were able to announce their decision to the court of a verdict of not guilty. The verdict received applause and the prisoner was discharged. So just reflecting on the evidence of the inquest and just a few queries that people have put up since after viewing the evidence, Mary expressly stated that she did not touch the attacker's face and she didn't know if he had a beard. So she had changed that evidence slightly from one account to another. And she did state in her statement that she heard Bertha cry out while she was fighting the man and after she ran outside to get help. But Bertha's wounds would have made this impossible, meaning that at the time Mary fled from the house, no blood had been shed if her story was true. It seems definitely established that Mary had blood on her clothes when she ran from the house, although it could not be shown to be human, obviously with that time, 1902, very, very difficult to ascertain. She said that the attacker dropped a knife, but no knife from outside the home was found and the wounds were consistent with one or more that did belong in the household. And curiously, Matthias Shippen, the father, was quoted as saying in court that he did not know how many years he'd been married. He didn't know the Christian names of his wife or the middle name of his daughter, Bertha. Unsurprisingly, Mary became increasingly reclusive following her acquittal. She moved away from Twitter to a small town where she became known as the Grey Lady. She later became ill with tuberculosis and spent time in a sanatorium. And she died of tuberculosis aged only 41 on the 4th of July 1919 at Mount Mary, South Australia, at her brother August Willem's home. And Gustave was the informant on her death certificate. Since then, the question has often been asked, if Mary didn't kill Bertha Shippen, then who did? Some believe the real killer was the girl's father, Matthias Shippen, who had been reputed to have had a history of rage and violence. 
Matthias had been charged with unlawfully wounding in July 1896, but was found not guilty. And the details of that case? Shooting and wounding. Matthias Shippen Farmer was charged with having, on the 5th of July 1896, shot at and wounded Carl August Hartwig at Twitter. Carl August Hartwig gave evidence that on the Sunday evening in question, he and his brother Herman and William Randomi were chased by Shippen as a result of a quarrel at Blenkiron's house. The prisoner tried to poke him with the barrel of a gun, which he held in his hands. He also tried to push the witness's brother with the gun. He went to help his brother, whereupon the prisoner shot at him from a distance of three or four yards, hitting him in the left leg between the ankle and the knee. The prisoner then fired towards William Randomi. I limped onto the road and then fainted. I did not know that the prisoner's son was at Blenkirons on the night of the quarrel. I did not know that his daughter was there. I understood Shippen was sent for to bring home his children. I did not know that the children were afraid to go home. Randomi had a stick, but I did not see him use it on the prisoner. Dr. Pullen said that he attended Hartwig for an oblique lacerated wound in the calf of the leg. He probed the wound and found one shot in it. It might have been a ricochet if the prisoner had stood facing Hartwig. William Radomi, whose evidence was given in German and interpreted, said the prisoner knocked him down twice. He saw the prisoner shoot twice and he cannot say whether he fired at the ground the first time and he struck the prisoner with a stick. Gustave Herman Hartwig said the prisoner called out strong loaded as he was following them with a gun. Corporal Deckett said that he arrested the prisoner who said, there were three against me, one on the right, one on the left and one behind. I called out four or five times, I will fire. One said, fire away. I fired and then one of them gave me a push and ran away. I fired again and missed. Thomas Blenkire and Farmer, who was called for the defence, gave evidence that Shippen's children were afraid to go home on account of the Hartwigs and Radomis outside the house. The prisoner was sworn and gave evidence that when the young men seized him, he told them to keep away. August Hartwig threw a stone which hit him on the head. Another struck him on the shoulder with a stick. He fired the gun sideways towards the ground to frighten them. Mr Glenn, in reply to his honour, said the Crown would not press the charge of feloniously wounding. It was an unlawful act to fire off a loaded gun in a struggle, and if they believed the facts as presented, then the prisoner, although a very respectable man, had no right to fire the gun and was guilty of unlawfully wounding. The jury, after ten minutes' absence, returned a verdict of not guilty and suggested that his honour should caution the prisoner as to the future use of firearms. His honour did so, telling Shippen that if young Hartwig had been killed, he would have had to stand trial for his murder. Rumours surfaced that Matthias had confessed to a murder on his deathbed. Pastor J.J. Stoltz reportedly heard the confession of Matthias Shippen on the night of the 30th of May 1911 and at many times in the murder investigations, so the day after the murder until the inquest started on the 9th of January, Mary apparently many times said that the man in her room the night of the murder was her father. Her mother believed her, however the police did not go further with it or act on it. And you have to consider too that those that were on the jury of the inquest were fellow men in the district, other farmers that were neighbours of the Shippens. It's quite possible that they were fearful of Matthias Shippen knowing what he was capable of. And Bertha had allegedly threatened to reveal that her father had killed a local hawker who had come to the house to sell his wares when he became overly familiar with Mrs Shippen. And also there are family members that mention that Matthias Shippen rode from Flaxman Valley back to his farm on the night of the 1st of January 1902. Mr Gratz, who owned Gratzstone Corner, cited Matthias Shippen riding from the sedan direction at around 4 to 4.30 in the morning on the 2nd of January 1902. A number of men rode from Shippen's farm to Wegener's farm, which is where they were staying, to see if it could be done in enough time to confirm if it was possible that Matthias could have actually done it. They had found a set of bloody clothes near a waterhole halfway between the Shippen farm and Greystone Corner, and again the police weren't interested. 
the theory was that their father had got the wind up that she would eventually tell about him killing this hawker and he decided to read of her. They thought that he had got up that night and he'd ridden a horse back down there from Eden Valley, cut Bertha's throat and rode back home again. There was a report that one horse was still wet with perspiration that next morning and one was dry. Alternatively, another local doesn't believe that Mr Shippen killed his own daughter. He could not have got there and back to Eden Valley by morning time. It is too rocky, too many shale outcrops to ride that distance at night. There was a 1984 film called The Ship and Mystery. It was the last of four telling movies that were titled Verdict that the ABC produced. So there's a book by Peter Donovan called The Trial of Mary Shippen. And there's also a book by Richard Dusky called The Twitter Tragedy, The True Story of the Bertha Shippen Murder. And Richard has a Facebook page as well titled The Twitter Tragedy. So if you're interested in having a look at different comments and maybe obtaining the book. And there are other documentaries that have covered the case that were later produced. And these included the claims from a lot of people at Murray Flats in the Barossa Valley who claimed that they knew who murdered Bertha. And I've included some of those theories. No one has ever been proven to have killed young Bertha Shippen. So Bertha Shippen's family, what became of them? Well, her father, Johann Matthias, known as Martin, died at Lights Pass, South Australia, on the 31st of May, 1911, aged 60. Her mother, Johanna, died at Udunda, South Australia, on the 8th of September, 1923, aged 79. Their first child, Pauline, was born at Flaxman's Valley, Crawford, South Australia, in August 1875. She died at 24 years old in December 1899 of pneumonia at Tuwita under the name Augusta Pauline. The second child, Fritz Karl Martin, was born on the 13th of May 1879. He married Flora Hermina Marie Krebs in South Australia in 1924 when he was 45 and Flory 33. They had two children, Dulcie in 1926 and Roy in 1927, which seemed to be the only descendants in the Shippen family. Fritz died on the 16th of November 1950 at Kilkenny, South Australia. His son Roy did say that uh, his father, so Roy's grandfather Matthias, did in fact own up years later to him and his sister as to what he did in terms of Bertha. The third child, Heinrich Johann Gustav, was born on the 1st of March 1881 at Twitter, and he died at Manjamup on the 1st of February 1947, aged 65. The fourth child, August Wilhelm, known as Gustav, was born on the 26th of May 1883 at Twitter. He married Isabel Essie Biddle in 1937. However, his death certificate says that he's a bachelor. Seems that Augie, as he was known by the family, settled in Mount Mary somewhere from the late 1910s until the mid-1950s and worked as a farm labourer. It had been found through research that he had in fact fathered a child and he ended his days with his daughter and her family. According to his family, he never discussed the case with them and it seems he never talked about it much with the locals at Mount Mary either. He was a gardener and he died on the 8th of February 1965 at Bradbury, South Australia. He is buried at the Stirling Cemetery. He was the informant on his sister Mary's death and trustee and main recipient of her will. Mary also gave her mother £42 per year for each year of her life in her will and she also allowed for the payments of gravestones for her four brothers if she predeceased them. The fifth child, Wilhelm Johann Gottlieb, was born on the 22nd of March 1886 at Twitter and he died on the 19th of February 1928 in Adelaide, aged 41. So there you have it, the sensational unsolved case of Bertha Shippen. It would be lovely if we could bring that inquest and the evidence into today and with today's technology, I'm sure that it certainly would have been solved very, very easily. If you are interested in sharing your story on my podcast, Family History Mysteries, please go to my Facebook page and send me a message. If you would like some assistance in filling in the gaps in your family tree to see what mysteries you solve, please get in touch.
And don't forget you can have early access to episodes by subscribing and you'll also gain access to bonus episodes. Yeah.